John, thank you so much for making a bit of time to speak with me. Um, I've just got back from Krakow in Poland, which is, of course, a town uh, with many somber reminders of the Holocaust. Now, some people argue that those horrific events prove that there is a need for a Jewish state, but I believe that you're part of a tradition with a, a rather different view. Yes, I am. Um, uh, indeed, that is an argument, and it would be foolish to dismiss that argument. And in principle, there's nothing wrong with the idea of oppressed Jews demanding a country of their own. The problem arises when any group of people demands the country of somebody else. Karl Marx famously talked about England and Ireland, and talked about one nation oppressing another, i.e. England over Ireland, can never itself be free. And exactly the same applies to Israel-Palestine. The problem was and is, whatever the intentions of Jewish migrants who went, say, from Poland to Palestine, they went with good intentions, most of them. Um, many of them didn't realise that it was a country with lots of people already living there. They became, in reality, colonial settlers, and they had two choices. They could either drop that status and try to relate to the native population and be like them, or they could lord it over them as colonial masters, and in effect, that's what's happened. I know that your book begins actually with a dedication to Tony Cliff, a revolutionary socialist and Palestinian Jew. Uh, I wonder if you could tell me a bit more about the, the Jewish socialist tradition, the anti-Zionist tradition. Yeah. Well, in fact, there are, there are several. Um, Cliff was a very remarkable man. In fact, he's the founder of the organisation I belong to, the Socialist Workers' Party. And indeed, he was um, brought up in a Zionist Jewish settler family in Palestine under the British mandate between the wars. I met him as a student in the 1960s, indeed as a, not just a Jewish student, but a Jewish student supporting Israel. I'd just come back from working on kibbutz, on the communes uh, in Israel, which aren't really communes because they're for Jews only. But Cliff um, convinced me and many other Jewish students to see the world and to see Israel very differently. First of all, to see it first and foremost from the point of view of the Arabs and the Arab refugees, which we'd never thought about before. So he was very influential in my own uh, change of attitude and change of heart. Um, in terms of traditions, there are, I mean, Cliff belongs to a revolutionary socialist tradition, which I now belong to. But of course, there was a, a, in a way, a much bigger and broader tradition called the Bund. The socialist Bund in Eastern Europe was made up of thousands and thousands of Jewish workers who resisted calls from the Zionists to go to Palestine, and their view was they should stand and fight with other socialists, non Jewish socialists, to resist oppression in the case of. The oppression they faced, it was the Tsar of Russia before the Russian Revolution. And that's a great tradition which has been broadly lost. And then there are other independent Jewish traditions. It's by no means the case. Whatever Zionism claims, it's automatically the spokesperson for Jewish people around the world. It's, it most certainly isn't. And what do some of these other traditions, or, or let me ask you specifically about, about yours, what is your analysis of Israel? What role does it play in the world, do you think? Yeah, well, in addition to what I was saying before, as it, uh, being a colonial settler state, it required uh, a great power as a sponsor. And there were several possibilities over the years. The two main sponsors in the end, in the first half of the 20th century, became the British Empire. I mean, um, I was saying on Saturday at the demonstration um, that the uh, Balfour Declaration is effectively a British Empire colonial document. Britain imposed a Zionist colony on Palestine, so its responsibility is enormous. In the second half of the 20th century, the United States became Israel's sponsor. And it's very, very specific. It became a sponsor insofar as Israel became uh, America's most heavily funded client state. $3, million, $3 billion a year, $100 billion by the end of the 20th century. Effectively, Israel could not survive without the American dollar. Why does America do this? Because Israel, as, as one of Ronald, a former American president called Ronald Reagan once said, Israel's like a semi-landlocked warship for the United States in the Middle East. Mm. Some people argue that there are attitudes within the Islamic world which represent an insurmountable obstacle to, um, to some sort of peaceful reconciliation within, uh, within the Middle East, between specifically Jews and Muslims. What are your thoughts about that? This is not just nonsense. Um, it's a great tragedy because Christian Europe was deeply anti-Semitic for many centuries, anti-Jewish, but the Muslim world wasn't. As a matter of fact, the Islamic Revolution, I deal with this in my book, I've got two chapters on it. The Islamic Revolution of a thousand years ago, when the great cities of Cairo and Baghdad were first built, um, 
demonstrated a fantastic degree of, of, of equality and fairness between the three religious communities. Obviously, the Muslims were a majority, but there was a genuine dialogue between Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And the Jews fared far better in their societies than they did in Christian Europe. And this is also true in the modern period, in early 20th century Iraq. A third, people don't know about this, but a third of the population of Baghdad was Jewish. It was a very prosperous uh, community and completely integrated and was quite hostile to the Zionist project because it understood this was uh, going to prize Jew and Arab apart, Jew and Muslim apart, in a way that those societies had no experience of. What do you think the solution is? What's the way forward? The solution, in my view, in one sense, is very sim uh, simple. Um, I think the analogy with South Africa is an important one. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are limitations to the analogy, but in terms of... You mean in terms of apartheid? Well, the, apar of the apartheid, apartheid, like Zionism, is a form of racism. It operates differently. Apartheid uh, uh, exploited the black majority. Uh, uh, Zionism excluded the Palestinian majority. In terms of the resistance, the Palestinians cannot overturn Zionism by themselves. They require allies. But in terms of a simple solution, South Africa is a perfect model. One person, one vote including the five million plus refugees who are excluded, this is second and third generation from 1948, if they were all given one person, one vote alongside Israelis, that would be a fair democratic mandate to take the situation forward, in my view, via one state rather than two states. So one democratic state? We, we, we... Yes, one democratic state um, with all the people who presently live in that part of the world taking part in the political process. Obviously, you need to put in place very special constitutional safeguards, uh, protecting cultural rights, religious rights, civic rights, and so on. But I would have thought in the 21st century that's very easily done. If the will is there, um, then um, there's no question that the implementation is, is certainly possible. And you mentioned that Palestinians uh, on their own cannot achieve this, that they need allies. Tell me a little bit more about strategically how we might get to that point. Yeah, the problem with the Palestinians, taking the South African analogy one stage further, that the black majority was very much a black majority in apartheid South Africa, and so the workers of South Africa and the black workers, when they began to move in the 1980s, were an enormously important power, challenging the apartheid state. Palestinian labour does not have that power. Uh, it's dispersed. Israel is not dependent on it. So the Palestinians need allies, first and foremost, in the Arab world. And historically, the most important country in the Arab world is Egypt. And we are seeing today the emergence of the Egyptian working class for the first time for two generations as an independent political and social force, which is intensely uh, uh, pro-Palestinian and has already demonstrated its capacity to support the Palestinians. So wider forces in the Middle East are a very important ally for the Palestinians. But then so are we. This new movement which now has its own acronym, three letters, BDS, Boycott uh, Disinvestment Sanctions. This is now a worldwide movement, um, and it's a very exciting movement, and it's a bit like the anti-apartheid movement, and Israel is very threatened by it. A, a, a document, a special paper, went to the Israeli cabinet two or three weeks ago, which talked about the threat of BDS, in its words, threatening to delegitimize the Israeli state. So, and, and quite frankly, the propaganda of BDS is, is more effective than its actual practice. Getting boycotts off the ground is quite hard, but still, there is some experience. It has been effective, and furthermore, there's a huge amount of support for us across the world, as I say. Well, John, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to speak with you. Thank you once again for making time. Okay, very good, thank you.